Bueno, buenos días. Hello, good morning everyone. The representation of uh, Guadalajara and Pending Random House, thank you very much for being here. Thanks to Fundación Telefónica for welcoming us again. And welcome to this uh, conversation with John Bandel. We are with uh, Nuria Barros. She's a great novelist, a poetry, um, a poetist, and she's the author of Eight Centimeters, the uh, La Luz de la Dinamo, her last book that has been awarded with the Iberian, Iberian American um, Prize, Hermanos Marchado. Uh, Nuria is uh, Benjamin Black's and John Vanville's translator. She has been able to translate uh, Miss Osmond. His, it is very well translated by Miguel Temprano Garcia. But she has been able to be here with us today. And thanks to John Vanville, of course, for being, us in Sp uh, being here again in Spain with us. I'd like to go um, briefly through the uh, incredible literacy uh, career of John Bambill. We had just John Bambill at the very beginning. He was a journalist at the Irish Press and he was the author of, um, of a very big, uh, very incredible book that was called Long Lankin and after that uh, Nang Spawn. They are not in Spanish yet but they will be published next year and after that we had uh, Birchwood, uh, Kepler, um, the Newton Letter, uh, Mephisto, the Book of Evidence, etc. There were many many books. Um, he, next, he won the, um, the, the Man Booker Prize with the C in 2005 and Banfield um, was asked for something. He was asked to write the script for a, t for a TV show um, a crime TV show, a TV show that was never done, but Banville liked that story and fortunately, fortunately he liked that character Dr. Quirk. He doesn't have a nickname, he's uh, the forensic that is the main character of this uh, crime novel Quirk. The irony has made that uh, some years ago the TV, well, the, the, this novel series was uh, became into a TV show, uh, TV show, sorry. And this first uh, novel was the first of a six uh, series novel. The last one was published uh, last year. That was awarded with a um, Valencia Negra award. He is here today with us because of this. He will receive this award in Valencia. And Alfaguara has published uh, Benjamin Black's novels too, but Banville's novel had another, another editor, as usually happens in, in the US. But eventually Banville accepted to be published in Alfaguara with uh, his novels from uh, as, as Banville, and we have had the privilege of uh, publishing his novels. Uh, we had, for example, uh, The uh, Blue Guitar, and uh, after that we had this incredible Miss... Osmond. After Booker, Bamville won other prizes, for example, Franz, Castle, Franz Kafka Award, um, or the European Prize uh, for Literature that was won by Javier Marias or Patrick Modiano. But maybe his, uh, well, he, his most beloved prize, so to speak, was the, uh, the Principe de Asturias Award. Uh, he was awarded with this prize in 2014, and the jury said that this prize was for two authors in one. And I'm quoting. Uh, to John Bamil because being so smart in his career and to other and to Benjamin Black who is the author of crime novels in year 2014 the year of uh, Principe de Asturias award we published in Spain the La Rubia de Ojos Negros in Spain that um, is um, the, the black eyed blonde and uh, the Chandler Hairs had gone to see him with a very intriguing proposal. It was just to resuscitate uh, Philip Marvel. Um, Van Bill started to work on that and the result was The Black Eyed Blonde and it was chosen as one of the best um, books of the year here in Spain and some people said that it was even better than Chandler. Uh, four years after we have Miss Osmond. Again, Van Bill, uh, accepts a complex challenge to put into Hen Henry James' uh, feet, although I think that this uh, uh, formula is not very convenient, he will explain it better. And uh, he resuscitates, so to speak, Miss Osmond or Isabel Archer, married to Gilbert Osmond, into uh, Mer uh, in Miss Osmond. I mean, um, this is the great uh, here, the um, Henry James great heroine. I would like to ask him why, why this challenge, and why Henry James. 
Paul? Henry James is the greatest novelist. Uh, there have been novelists who are perhaps more intellectually uh, gifted than he, but as pure novelist, he is the one. He left us at least half a dozen absolute masterpieces. Um, so why wouldn't I try to emulate him? Why wouldn't I try to go one better? I refer to the, <laughs> the portrait of a lady as the prequel to my book. <laughs> um, he is a superb artist, uh, and of course I, in my arrogance, my probably stupidity, I decided to to finish the book because the the portrait of a lady really isn't finished. It's it's he saw that himself. Henry James in his notebooks thought on at least two occasions of writing the, the sequel to it, but didn't do it because he had other things to do, so I did it for him. Well, I would like to speak about uh, Henry James, or at least start in this part of the interview speaking about the conversation about, um, speaking about Henry James, I would like to quote a sentence of uh, Cynthia Osik. As she said, mysteriously, James becomes more and more our contemporary. It is as if our sensibilities are only just catching up with his. Do you agree on this? Yes. Was the Portrait of a Lady is the first great feminist novel um, written by a man who was homosexual, of course. Uh, he, his, all his friends, all his best friends were women. He loved women. And even more than that, he found women infinitely interesting. Uh, and that's something I have in common with James. I regard men as unendurably boring. I always say that my, my idea of hell is a, an endless dinner party with just men all talking nonsense and talking about themselves and saying how wonderful they are. Um, one woman would turn it to paradise. So my book, uh, my, my sequel to, <laughs> to the prequel, um, is driven by women it's driven by, I hope, women's sensibility. I flatter myself that I was always a feminist from childhood on. Uh, my mother was a very strong woman, uh, probably too strong, but she taught me about freedom and self-assertion. Uh, she taught me what it is to be human. Yeah, my father was a delightful man, but he, he sort of said, well, I, I don't have any responsibility here, as all Irish men did in those days and probably still do. Uh, so my mother raised me. Uh, I loved her. Uh, she infuriated me. We fought. Uh, but she was... It's just occurred to me now, she was the Isabel Osmond, the Isabel Archer of my early years. John, um... Well, John, the fascination that you feel by, for, for Henry James is shared by many writers. I would like to quote, just in the last decade, there have been three books about Henry James. In 2004, there was The Master, by Contoiding. That year appeared the, do you know, uh, Henry James, the story of a novel, I think she said, from Henry Jobs. And in 2008, we had the tribute of uh, Alan Hollyhurst, The Line of Beauty. However, none of these authors assumed the challenge that you have assumed. They speak about Henry James, but they don't get into his feet 
I mean, they don't decide, decide to, to embody uh, Henry James, so to speak. So when I was preparing the conversation, I found this uh, mentioned by Jeffrey Eugenit. I'm sure that you know him because he's the author of uh, The Suicide Virgins. And it was quite funny. He said, well, he was asked to make the critics of uh, Miss Osmond for New York Times. And he says, when he was asked to review uh, Miss Osmond, June Van Vell's sequel to uh, The Portrait of a Lady by Henry James, my first question was, is it written in James' style? Informed that, I wa that it was, I bowed my head and awe and pity. The great Banville, I feared, was attempting the impossible. So while you were writing Miss Osmond, did you, had, did you have had the feeling that the task was impossible? That you were mm, facing something impossible? No, if, if you concentrate sufficiently deeply on any task, you can do it. Um, I, I wrote a lot of it when I was teaching at the University of Chicago. And I was living on campus. And if any of you have not been there, I can tell you, at the campus of the University of Chicago, there is nothing to do. Uh, you know, there are no bars, no restaurants, no anything, except lots and lots of students. Um, so I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, uh, and I sank into myself. Uh, yeah. Concentration is such a strange thing. It's... To concentrate deeply is to have an out-of-body experience. I ceased to be myself when I was writing this book. Sometimes I would lean away from my hand writing and I would look at it from a distance. Um, I wasn't there. But then, as I always say, even when I'm writing as myself, as John Banville, I'm not there either because there is no John Banville who walks about the world. There's only a John Banville who sits at the desk writing. When I stop sitting at the desk, that person ceases to exist. Some years ago I was, a friend of mine gave me a, an examination paper from an Irish examination paper and there was a piece of anonymous prose and he said, what do you think of that? And I read it and I said, well it looks vaguely familiar, I must have read it somewhere before. He said, no, you wrote it. I had completely forgotten it. Uh, I forget, as soon as I've done it, it's gone. You know this, every writer knows this. It's one of the difficulties I have when I come to Spain is that the, the time lapse between having written the book and it being published here, I can no longer remember it. <laughs> In fact, one year I came, I shouldn't even confess this, but I came and I realized that the book I was being interviewed about was one that I had no memory of. So I had to quietly get the interviewers to tell me about it so that I could answer their questions. <laughs> Remind me, you know, remind me who this character is and who that character is. It's, it's a strange hallucinatory state, that state of deep concentration. And for instance, at, you know, you start in the morning and you think, well, I think, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how I did it yesterday. And there's this blank page. Where am I to start? How am I to start writing? And then I fiddle about and I make another cup of coffee and I refill my fountain pen and somehow by mid-morning I'm writing something and then by about three o'clock in the afternoon I've sunk to a level where I am no longer the person who sat down at the desk in the morning. Time becomes very strange, I've told this story before but I was writing one day and my wife looked into the study and said I'm going to the shops to do some shopping and I said fine and then she put her head in again and said something else. I said, I thought you were going to the shops. And she said, I have been to the shops. I had no sense of that interval having passed. Uh, you know, there wasn't even evidence on the page to, to record that time. So I, I don't know what was happening. Um, it's a blissful state to be in. It's very difficult. 
wrestling with language is one of the most difficult things a human being can be required to do. But it is also blissful because one is not oneself. I sometimes think that this is the reason I keep writing these bloody books. It's just to escape from the self. <laughs> Well, Banville was uh, really generous and he sent me the first 40 pages of the novel and I really read them um, very accurately and I remember that first reading some years ago. Three memorable scenes, of course. The first one is the, the beginning. When Isabella Osmond uh, comes to Paddington Station, she comes from Rome because uh, her, her cousin Ralph has passed away and Banville says... His, his death was very difficult for him, it's some kind of algebra or geometry exercise. So she comes to the station and Banville writes about all the movements of her body, her thinking. He describes the people on the street as if, uh, despite the determination of her walking, she, they were not sure of where they were going to and they didn't care about that. It's a great scene. There's another scene, that first chapter, that is the one of an, uh, an unknown person, a humble person that is crying, desperately crying, and really moves Isabel. And in, th in these 40 pages, there's another great scene, a scene of that night at a restaurant. Isabel goes to have dinner, she's alone. And while she's reading the letter, she sees that there's a gentleman having dinner alone. He is more or less normal, he's strong, he's wearing glasses, but he has a jacket, uh, a stripped jacket, uh, in um, blue, uh, sky blue and yellow. And that jacket makes Isabella think that maybe he's an actor. We're always into uh, Isabella's mind. Uh, we know about many things that she has gone through, and we see that eyes crossing is almost sexual until Isabel looks again and the gentleman has disappeared. This is how this uh, first uh, 40 pages ended up. Of course I was thinking of well now a love story is going to begin with this gentleman with his jacket and when I s received the novel I was looking for this gentleman and I'm not going to do any spoiler but uh, this gentleman does not appear again. So I closed the book and I said, this man is a great writer. So this is what happens in life. Sometimes we uh, see people, and but we think that something important could happen with these people and probably we won't see them again. So I would like to ask him, how do you um, operate this mar marvelous um, sectors of life and literature? Your books are like l the life, but they are much more. How do you do this? Well, first of all, the man that she sees in the dining room of the hotel is Henry James, of course. <laughs> See, you hadn't spotted that. <laughs> He's come to check on how she's doing and how I'm doing. Come here. Um, but it's funny you should mention the erotic aspect of writing. And I think more and more, I suppose, as I get older and older and the erotic gets further and further away from me, um, I do think that it is a kind of, there is something erotic, there's something sexual. I was doing a, a question and answer session like this in, in Ireland and somebody pointed out that the first paragraph of this book uh, is really an orgasm. And I went back and read it and I thought, yes it is in a way. Um, it moves in that way that it becomes more and more dense and more and more loses itself and then it's resolved. Uh, I didn't intend that, of course, but uh, I do think more and more that the... Uh, this is especially true of music. You listen to music, it is intensely erotic. Um, and so this is my, my latest theory of art, is that it's all based in, in the loins. It's all, it's all based in the erotic. Um, I wanted Isabel to have a life, I wanted her to have a sensual life. When Henry James wrote the prequel in the 1880s, uh, most things could not be said. You couldn't, you couldn't talk about sexuality. He had subtle ways of doing it, and they're, they're wonderful. Um, but I wanted to give her a, a, a passionate life. Let's leave out the erotic or the 
sexual. I wanted her to have a passionate life because in the portrait of a lady, what she lacks in her life is passion. She makes the great mistake of marrying a very dried up dilettante and she needs she needs to have to have a life. Henry James said that he wanted to portray a woman who was affronting her fate. Wonderful phrase. Uh, sorry to the interpreter, that's almost impossible to interpret. He means is that a, a person who was going to grasp life by the the shoulders and say, I'm 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 going to have you and she's she never gets that chance in the portrait of a lady. I intended to allow her to do that in this book, but I couldn't quite because what I want is for somebody to write a sequel to my sequel. And I want it to be a woman. Nuria, here's your chance. Uh, I would like a woman to write about Isabel Archer okay. and about her, her quest to live fully and to live passionately. Voy a leer para... I'm going to read. If you haven't read it, you still haven't read it. I would like you to get into the environment that Banville creates. I thought was the last word that the that Raf Touchet had pronounced in her presence. And now he saw that she had taken for granted that she would always be loved by someone without needing to love anybody in exchange. This was complacency, this was fantasy, this was proud or pride. These aspects had underpinned her idea of herself as a singular figure and a force in the world, or at least in her version of the world. And this is how she had been able to live happy in the happy of her and as she understood it was not much bigger than a doll's house. She was happy. Well, the word took her back to the reality, the reality of the sunlight, the reality of the street, the reality of people walking around, of the strange transaction that was about being alive. She had lived f uh, with his, her husband for many years. She, there were many, but very long. She was at home that she has created. And she, had she been happy? Maybe at the beginning, but this first stage had led to a second terrible part, a situation that had ended up uh, with, in a very rude way and she was still shaking. So now she was thinking about the same question that she had been asking since she, she left Italy. The question of how many truths about nature and cer real circumstances of her marriage had been known without telling herself that she knew that. If she had made a great unfairness with herself and with the others, maybe this was the unfairness. She had forced her own ignorance. But how? shouted her. How could I have avoided that with her husband and Madame Merle telling her to keep on being blind? Having that silk blind in front of her eyes. Her husband had lived with her in that small house, but out of this house all the time, sounding as he had wanted to do it, with his hands in his pockets and bowing just to see her sitting down with her arms around her knees and her head. That, and she couldn't even see her feet. I would like to uh, speak about feminism again that has been mentioned by Mbamville since the very beginning. I'm sure that you all have read um, Portrait of a Lady, but um, I will give you some details to sp uh, speak a little bit about the plot. The protagonist is uh, Isabel Archer. Uh, her father, her parents died, she gets an inheritance and she travels to Europe to uh, confirm her independence. As she has money, there are many suitors. She becomes into um, a very 
coveted um, award, so to speak. Uh, everything uh, sur surrounds this, but unfortunately, Isabel, and that is a very powerful character, uh, makes the wrong choice. She chooses the wrong husband. This is Gilbert Osmond, someone that marries her because of her money. And the second part, second part of the novel, that has uh, the psychological complexity that you always look for in Henry James. In the second part of the novel, Isabel discovers that uh, her husband has married her because of her money. He has been unfaithful, and apart from this, the um, his uh, husband has a daughter from a previous marriage. The daughter is not the daughter of his o of his former wife, but of a lover. The novel ends up with uh, Isabel when she comes across all this. She uh, leaves Italy, she leaves from where they live, and she uh, goes to London to see his, uh, her cousin, who is uh, about to die. In fact, the cousin has lent, the, has lent her the money, and the novel ends up with Isabel's choice of going back to Rome. And the end is open. It's an open end. We don't know whether Isabel goes back to Rome, Rome because she has accepted uh, the, her marriage, if she goes back to Rome because she wants to rescue her stepdaughter, or if she goes back to Rome to break the marriage. And if that was the case, if this was the, the case in the last uh, question, Isabel would appear as a pioneer of feminism, of what the um, social emancipation and political emancipation of women was. This feminism topic that uh, is uh, mentioned by Henry James in The Portrait of a Lady is resumed by Vanville in a very strong way and it is developed in his novel because he will decide which of these three questions, wh what's the answer to these three questions that were pending. If she comes back to resume her marriage, to rescue her stepdaughter or to break that marriage. So, you just imagine what, the, the, what that means, I mean, to be a woman in 1886, to make a mistake, the minimum mistake to destroy a woman's life. Miss Osmond, among many other things, as you'll see when you read it, is the story of a very intelligent revenge. And really, with a Power f with a very powerful uh, feminist um, uh, feeling. I would like to ask Banville if he believes that Isabel Archer should be reivindicated as a feminist figure, as a um, feminist character, one of the main feminist characters. I think, uh, uh, yes, I think she is. Um Perhaps without realizing it, she is a, a feminist hero. Um, she, that was certainly how I read her when I read the book first when I was in my 20s. Um, uh, I read her slightly differently when I read the book when I was in my middle age. I read it differently again when I was <laughs> tuffering on the brink of old age. Um, this is the wonderful thing about great works of art, that they are different every time you look at them or listen to them or read them. Um, I'm slightly... If, feminist has become a cliched word. I would rather say that she has... she fulfills her life or at least that's her aim, to fulfill her life, to live, it as, to live her life as fully and as passionately as she can. This is the duty of all of us. We're just given one little moment on earth, uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. Um, it's, it's not even a, the blink of an eye in, in, in terms of the time of the universe. But while we're here, it is so much as the, as the poet Rilke says, being here is much, and you know, because being here is, is much, and because, and because being here, it, it, it's the things that are here require us and seem to concern us, us the most fleeting of all. Sorry again to the interpreter. Now he's talking about 
the duty that we have to use our moment and to live as well as we can. And that's what she's doing. And it's not just women who do that. Men are supposed to do it. We have a way to go still before we catch up and learn how to live. Uh, we're still... Men really haven't come out of the caves. Women have, I think. Uh, we're still in the jungle. Certainly if we look at contemporary politics. In Europe and America we see that <laughs> men haven't progressed very far. But women have a great lesson to teach us in how to live. And that was James's great theme throughout all of his books. As Lambert Struthers, the, one of the characters in... Uh, sorry, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's telling me to shut up and get on with it. Uh, I must tell you a little story. You know, W.B. Yeats, the great Irish poet, his wife was, he saw her as a mystical creature. And I was at a, uh, a festival in, I think it was Buenos Aires or uh, Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo it was. And there was a, a Yeats scholar giving a talk on uh, Yeats and George Yeats, the, Yeats's wife. And we were sitting in a very small room which had these Venetian blinds at the back. It was a completely still day. And when she mentioned George Yates's name, the blinds at the back went to And the person giving the lecture said, oh, it's all right, it's just, it's just Mrs. Yates passing by. So this was Henry passing by. Um, Henry gets lifted up. What were we talking about? Life, how to live it. Yes, in The Ambassadors, the character Lambert Strether, middle-aged, aging, realizing that he's missed out on life, he says to one of the younger characters, live, live all you can, it's a mistake not to. The train will only pass through the station once, and when it's gone, it's gone. And that was, look, it's a simple lesson, you know, all art is simple. It just tells us to live as intensely as you can, to live to the top of your ability. And that's what Isabel is determined to do. Is that Bambi all right, Henry? <laughs> Bambi, da otra vuelta de tu... Bumble goes further away in feminism because we always assume from um, Virginia, Virginia Woolf's um, work that we, ne we women needed money to be free. This is a, a metaphor of, um, of this, to having our own house, our own money, etc. But when the novel starts, and we'll make a spoiler again, but in the case of Banville, there are never spoilers because the pleasure is on the style rather than on the plot. Isabel uh, takes a lot of money from the bank, but after that she loses the, um, the, the bag with that money. And curiously, with that loss, she feels even more free. So, what is freedom, what is woman's freedom about, then? Well, freedom is a... I don't think any of us can be free, and I don't think we should be. Because, well, I won't speak for all of us. If I were to be free, I would have to be Robinson Crusoe on Desert Island. If we deal with other people, we are not free. And that's the way it should be. We owe a debt to other human beings. And I actually said to one of my interviewers this morning, when we fall in love, we give up our freedom. We become slaves. We become... We enter into a state of delighted slavery and transcendent slavery. So freedom is not such a... not such a great thing. Freedom is inevitably selfishness. And this is one of the things that Isabel learns in Henry James's great book. She learns that in order to be free she would have to be alone. And that's no good. 
That's not the way to live life. That one has to give oneself up to other human beings. Um, I intended my book to end with her giving herself to someone, meeting some good man, some feminist man, and moving to America and achieving her fate. When I came to the end of the book, I realized I couldn't do that because Isabel is still on a journey. Most people forget, even I had forgotten, I think Henry James himself forgot, that Isabel is very young. At the end of the portrait of a lady, she's only about 29. Uh, she has lived a lot of life in the six or seven years that she's been in Europe, but she's still very young. She has most of her life ahead of her, and she has the world ahead of her, and she's going to do great things. That's why, Nuria, you have to write the sequel to my sequel. Es un compromiso público. Well, it's a public commitment. I will do it. I'm going to read another paragraph of the novel. Where again, the novel is, uh, if one from the, uh, the inner world of the characters, now we dive into Isabel's mind. One day, in the Palazzo Rocanera, the oppressive um, Rome's house that she shared with her husband and his daughter, uh, well, she was in one of the living rooms, she had stopped after the door and she had seen one second before she realized that she was there, she had seen her husband and their friend, Madame Merle. They were looking into each other's eyes. That should be a break into a long conversation. There was nothing weird in them speaking that way. Gilbert Osman from Baltimore knew Serena Merlin from Brooklyn. She had known her for many years and she had known her much before Isabel had appeared. However, Isabel was surprised not only because of the focused uh, and that calm way of looking into each other's eyes, but the fact of Madame Mel being uh, standing while Osmond was sitting down at a very big coach looking at her with his hands stretched and his hands in his pockets like he used to sit down like Ralph Tuchet used to sit down sorry but he was quite indolent and she had never been um, he had never let the others see him that, this way and he said that she, she had to go, that he, he had to go for a walk, so Madame Merle was exactly the same. She was standing on her feet and her eyes were shining. Isabel thought that in Jane, Miss Janeway had this spark in her eyes. The perplexity and other different things that she were, they were going through. Isabel hadn't been perplexed that day. In the Palazzo Romano, but sooner or later she would be. Of course she would. Who could know that? Who could better know that better than Madame Mel? So, Shun Banville and Harry James share a characteristic. They are both two stylists, so to speak. They both have, uh, and I will focus on Banville, they have a very beautiful prose, and sometimes the plot is not necessary. They have a very beautiful lyricism. Banville says that a style progresses and plot is dragging behind of it. Banville, in this novel, captures the James uh, style, uh, the um, pace of his prose, the uh, psychological digression that uh, James has, but however, when you read the novel, you'll see that it's not a Henry James novel. It's a novel where you can see Henry James, but you can see him, you can see Banville, and although he will be surprised by what I'm going to say, we can also find Benjamin Black. Probably he'll say, Benjamin Black? 
he'll he has always spoken about uh, Benjamin Black as uh, an alter ego that writes um, crime novels in three months. He enjoys with what he does. Nothing to do with John Banfield that writes uh, literary novels that uh, he's always trying to climb the Himalaya. But there's a feedback of, of Benjamin Black. Where have I seen Benjamin Black? In the novel there's a surprising moment, almost at the end, where we move from Isabel's consciousness to the to the inside of Gilbert Osmond. And this husband, this calculating, smart, um, an evil husband, uh, during all, all these six pages he develops this dark side that Benjamin Black describes in such a very good way. I seen Benjamin Black there and I liked it because I'm, I'm a great admirer of uh, Benjamin Black. You can see Benjamin Black there. In fact, I was really wanting that Gil Gilbert Osmond had more pages. He could have appeared more, but I've seen a little bit more of Benjamin Black in the novel. And when I speak to Banville about his uh, Benjamin Black's novels, I always tell him that the, the Quirk, uh, Quirk's daughter, he, she always wears the same dress. She always has a, um, a black dress with a white, um, with, with a white um, stripe. And I always tell, her, tell him, please change that dress. But in this novel, Gilbert Osmond's daughter is wearing a black dress with a white uh, neck. <laughs> what? I mean, Benjamin Black, he's here, no matter who wants or not. So this is like the, 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 the trinity, so to speak. We will have Henry James, John Vanville, and Benjamin Black in just one novel. So would you agree on the fact that Benjamin Black mm, appears very briefly on the stage? Oh, my dark brother, Benjamin Black, <laughs> he stands behind me. <laughs> Just when I'm having a good time, he leans over and says, I'm here still. <laughs> um, I hadn't thought of that. Um, yes, I, I, when I sent the book into my English publisher, I said, look, I know nothing about women's clothes. Can you please suggest other things they can wear? Uh, she didn't. I mean, she's a woman, my publisher, but she didn't. Um, I'm afraid whenever I conceive of a woman. She's always dressed in a black dress with a little lace collar. This is a failure of imagination on my part and you spotted it. But I can blame it on Benjamin Black. He did it. I didn't. Right? <laughs> um, look, there's me, whatever constitutes me. And that creature, that sensibility produces all these books by all these these personae, uh, Benjamin Black is me, Raymond Chandler is me, Henry James is me. The only person who isn't me is Tom Banville. Um, I have no sense of myself. I have a sense of myself in the world as a citizen, as a father, as a, you know, a person with a responsibility to society and politics and all the rest of it. No, but Banville is just a machine. No, not a machine. He's a spirit that makes works of art. That's his business. And I couldn't live as him in the world. Um, there's no way for an artist to live in the world. The artist, as I say, ceases to exist when he stands up from his desk, when he walks away from the canvas, when he he used the piano that he's been composing at. That's the, the person who produces these things. But I'm appalled by the notion that Benjamin Black has wormed his way into, uh, into Mrs. Osmond. Um, thanks, Nuria. <laughs> but you're right, of course. Um, and you know, look, the novel is a wonderful form. It's... it's the odd thing about the novel is that it's the form that novelists hate. We hate having to work in this form. We all want to be composers. Because when you're a composer, it's pure form. You don't have to deal with the ordinary stuff of life. But that is the glory of the novel, that it's untidy, it's ugly, it's 
ill-formed, it's stupid, it's transcendently beautiful, it's like, it's life. Um, and the novel is made out of life, it's bleeding chunks of life are taken. You know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine recently, he said that he was at a dinner party and he was, uh, no, it was a woman, uh, a woman, she was sitting opposite Meryl Streep. And she was terribly flattered by the interest that Meryl Streep was taking in her, you know, she was talking to her very animatedly and she suddenly realized that Meryl was simply learning how to do her, you know, how to... She was studying her as a character. And this is what artists do. We take... I've, I've seen myself. I've seen people, you know, at a dinner party or having a drink with somebody in a pub and they're talking away and they suddenly stop and you see them say, he's using me, he's, he's, he's sucking the life out of me. I always tell the story that my wife and I, when we were married first, and you know how it's always difficult in the first few years of marriage when you're adjusting to each other and you have these colossal fights, stupendously, you know, beasts in the jungle kind of fights. And we were driving somewhere and my wife was in full rhetorical uh, uh, spate telling me what a monster I am, what a hideous bastard I am. And it was wonderful. And I said, can I use that? <laughs> and she said, she said, what? She said, you're even more of a monster than I thought you were. I said, yeah, I know, I know, but can I use it? <laughs> and she said, oh, all right. Every writer should have a spouse like that. And he says, oh, all right. Because she recognized that in order to make art, one has to be a cannibal. One has to consume the people around, around one. I take things from people. A voice here, a, a, a... I had a terrible experience, I must tell you this. When I worked in the newspapers, when I worked at night, I was a sub-editor or copy editor, whatever you call it here, and um, I worked with a fellow who was very sad, all his siblings, his brothers and sisters, were all terribly successful, but he wasn't, and he was terribly overweight, but he was much more intelligent than he realized he was. And I heard him having a conversation with uh, one of his colleagues, and I used it in a book, right, almost verbatim. And he came to me and he said, I read that book of yours, I, I heard an echo in there, but, and I said, oh, no, 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 it wasn't you, it wasn't you, it wasn't you. He died that night. And I've never, I've, I mean, I'm not saying that I had anything to do with it, but that by that horrible coincidence, he died on the night that he had seen my portrayal of him. So we are cannibals, we are absolutely ruthless. We will do anything, we will sell our children for a fine phrase. Uh, never trust an artist. We're monsters. Is that right, Nuria? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe women writers are different. Mm. I doubt it, but... Yo también. Uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> anyway. Bueno. Llegó el momento. Okay, so now we have to open the... Uh, Q&A session, I would like to start with some, uh, some journalists that haven't been able to interview Bambil. And while we think about more questions, we will start by the journalists that are here with us today, if they want to introduce themselves and to pose any question. We apologize, but we can't hear the mic. Yeah, Nuria, well... Speaking about the the topics that you've mentioned, I would like to know what differences has uh, the writer found when diving uh, into Henry James and at the same time to uh, dive into Chandler. I mean, what difficulties, what differences uh, would you find in these um, aspects? And in relation to this, I would like to know if there are other writers, for example, um, 
uh, other texts, um, I don't know, that could be around because in this um, feminist uh, point of view, uh, we have different emblems and I don't know, well, if... Uh, if uh, these uh, type of, um, of texts have, uh, have been around your mind? Are the feminist texts? Um, it would be foolish for me to masquerade as a feminist, to masquerade as a sociologist or a political scientist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I write novels. Um, I tell stories, I tr try to make the sentences as close to perfect as I can. That's all I do. Um, I have no program, I have no agenda. I take my motto from Kafka, who said wonderfully, the artist is the one who has nothing to say. I have nothing to say, I have no message, I have no... When I sit down to write, I just want to get it right. I just want to get that sentence as near to perfect as possible. Nothing else matters. Uh, and if I get the sentence as near to perfect as I can, then that sentence will generate the next sentence. And the next sentence will generate the next one. And after two, three, four, five years, I have a book. And it's, I think I can't do any more with this. I'll give it up. I'll abandon it. Paul Valéry, French poet and critic, said beautifully, a work of art is never finished, only abandoned. So I would like to say, I really would like to, to, to sit at a gathering like this and talk about how committed I am to, you know, social life of my time and so on, but I'm not. I'm only committed to what I do, which is a I'll put it this way, I'm always amazed at this obsession that I have to sit at a desk day after day, month after month, year after year, writing sentences, trying to get them right, that that gets published and other people are interested in what I've done. This seems to me an amazing, amazing phenomenon. I always want to say to people, but why, why are you interested in this thing? It's like you know, your dreams. Nobody's ever interested in your dreams. I always make the analogy that uh, <laughs> you have one of those extraordinarily powerful dreams that you only have two or three times in your life. And you get up in the morning, you try to tell the person on the other side of the breakfast table about the dream. The first thing they do is yawn because there's nothing more boring than other people's dreams. Um, what I've been privileged to do is to have spent my life making dreams that are coherent and that are interesting to a surprisingly large number of people. Even if it was only a few hundred, it would still be amazing. I remember saying to a friend of mine that, that really I only had a couple of thousand readers and he said, that's a lot of people, which is true. Uh, to be able to peddle one's dreams to other people and have them appreciate them and to have one's dreams find an echo in other people's consciousness is an extraordinary thing. I am extraordinarily privileged. It's hard work, but, you know, easy work is not interesting. I'm not sure if that's an answer to your question, but no, I have... I didn't study feminist books before I wrote this and I never thought of this being a feminist book until I'd written it. Um, so I never know anything. Look, again, Kafka said, you know, I wish I could remember the exact quote. He says, we, I don't write as I think, I don't think as I should, I don't, you know, and he said that everything goes on in deepest darkness. And that's how it is. It's all, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Somehow something gets done in the end, but it's done by a process of stumbling and ignorance and darkness. Another pregunta. Hola, buenos días.
Hello, good morning. I would like to ask you about um, this approach to Henry James. It has been in three ways. First of all, you did it as a reader, after that as a writer, and after that you've, you've made him become a character in the novel. So what do you think that each of these stages can tell us about these, uh, this Henry, Henry James, or how do you perceive the differences of these three different aspects? Well, first of all, being a reader is one of the great privileges of life. I have nothing but sympathy for people who, who can't read. I don't mean people who are illiterate, but people who can't appreciate what they're reading. Because it's one of the great, the great pleasures, one of the great fulfillments of life to read a great novel, a great poem, listen to a great piece of music, which is a kind of reading, look at a great painting, which is a kind of reading as well. Um, how lucky we are. Henry James has been a presence in my life since my early twenties, which means I came to him quite late. Uh, by a wonderful coincidence, I first read the portrait of a lady in Florence. And I didn't realize until years afterwards that I was staying at a hotel which was just around the corner from where Henry James, almost exactly a hundred years before, had begun to write the book. Um, these little coincidences are always fascinating. I would like to have known him. I think that he, he was very guarded. He was very, he had to be guarded. He was homosexual in a time when you couldn't be publicly homosexual, as we saw in the case of Oscar Wilde. I would like to have known him. I would like to have listened to one of those endless sentences of the kind that I'm speaking now. In fact, I think I'm turning into Henry James. Uh, <laughs> but I also would like to have known his brother, William James, uh, the philosopher, who I think was, was much more fun than Henry. Um, I read the book. Uh, I was entranced by it. I recognize that Henry James was one of the first great modernist writers. Almost nobody has followed his direction. Uh, they went to the avant-garde direction, which is always, you know, the avant-garde is always much more fun. There's more stuff happening and there's more, you know, girls like it more than being merely Henry James. Um, but I think that, that the modernist road that Henry James opened is a road that uh, I and a few other people have followed. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a road <clears throat> that's very rich and uh, I think it's a beautiful road. So that was reading him. Then I, when I decided to write this book, I read the book entirely differently because I was excavating it, I was mining it, uh, and I read it entirely differently. Uh, I noticed with great uh, pleasure the, the minor mistakes that he made. For instance, I think he's forgotten what age Isabel is. In part two he presents her as a sort of, uh, almost as a middle-aged lady, but she's still only 28, 29. Um, but I appreciated again the subtlety and the humor, uh, very few people see the humor in James, but it's there. Um, and then I had to bring him into the book as a very minor appearance, very brief appearance, because I had to, I had to say to him, Henry, is it all right for me to be doing this? Um, uh, so I brought him in and he, he left quietly without making a comment. But I'm going to take it that that was approval. Uh, he's one of the great sensibilities, one of the great human beings. There haven't been many people like him. For instance, I don't think Shakespeare was a human being. Uh, I think Shakespeare was um, a medley of voices, medley of sensibilities, but I don't think he was a human being. 
Whereas with Henry James, you have the sense of man living fully the life of the world, this life that we're given, uh, which, as I said, our, it's, our, it's our duty to live. Um, so I have great sympathy, I mean empathy, with, with James. Um, he would have disdained me as an ill-educated little Irish man, my God, you know. James, <laughs> he was going from America to, uh, to England and the boat stopped at a place in, in down the south of Ireland, Cove, and James looked out at Ireland and he sort of shook his head and said, no, 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 I'm going to go on. But then he came back and he stayed at, at, at Dunleary, which is a seaside place outside Dublin, and he had a good time there. But I think James was rather ashamed of his Irish uh, origins, uh, even though his father was one of the most wealthy men in uh, New York, left a huge fortune, his grandfather, uh, left a huge fortune to his father, and his father, who was a ne'er-do-well, a wonderful ne'er-do-well, uh, he spent it all by making endless trips to Europe and bringing the whole family with him, and, and Henry James became an international figure because of an international personality, an international man. Uh, because of that, uh, wonderful, I wish I had a father like that. So, uh, you know, I suppose what I'm doing is, oh, this book doesn't fall over. Uh, I suppose it's a declaration of love for this wonderful human being. To have had such a sensibility to be able to get into the minds of so many people, to have seen what it is like to be, to be able to Henry James caught, especially in the later novels, the feeling of what it is to be alive, to be conscious. That it's not a clear path, that we live in confusion. We live stumbling through a fog, a beautiful, luminous fog. And out of the fog every now and then come these strange creatures, other people whom we fear or to whom we fall in love with um, but we're always clawing our ways through the fog and that's what he catches in those marvelous novels of his what it is to be alive to be to live in the state of blissful confusion uh, a great artist I mean a great artist what more can I say and it didn't fall over <laughs> Time goes by in a very weird way and I see that we um, have many questions but we have run out of time so we have, there's one, one last question so who wants to take the floor we have to close with this. I would like to ask him, during your life when you uh, see everything that happens around you and these are things that happen in life when you express this in your books have you lost any friend have you lost any people that were that were close to you when you have explained your stories do you feel alone um i'm not very good on friendship i don't do friends for me there's either love or there's indifference uh i wish you know, this is a great loss in my life uh, I, f I find friends especially male friends nothing more boring um, I have to have passionate relationships with people or nothing um, I can be polite I can put on strap on my mask as we all do in the morning and go out and be plausible uh, But for me, is that, yes, as I say, there's either passion or there's nothing. And I, I suspect that's true for everybody. We pretend to be friends, we pretend to be, you know, have that smile that we do. I'm particularly good at that smile, I wear it most of my life. Um, <laughs> I remember talking to my friend Claudia Margaret, a wonderful Italian writer, and we were talking about doing book tours. We said, 
you arrive back in your hotel at night, you, you realise you've been smiling all day, and you sort of, you, you just a sand on your face. It's like, and it sort of cracks like a piece of glass. And then you fall face forward across the bed, still wearing your overcoat, you say, never again, never again. <laughs> but then you get up next day and you do it again. We have to live in the world, we have to. I think it was Kafka who said that we should, no, Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer, who said we should greet each other uh, as tragic companions. Compagnon de misère, uh, my, you know, companion in misery, I greet you. And this is a sacrifice that we make. We have to give up the self in order to deal with others. My friend Martin Amos, the book of his is a title I really envy him. It's called <clears throat> Other People, A Mystery. And I always say, other people are infinitely mysterious. I remember once I was, I was going to Budapest on the train. And the train stopped outside Cologne, so one of those cities in the middle of Europe. And it stopped at the back of an apartment building. Big apartment building. 40, 50 rooms. And it was night. And lots of the windows were lighted. And because it was the back of the building, people didn't realize that there were people like me, observers like me, sitting in the train watching them. And I sat there for 10 minutes, amazed, watching these lives. People having their dinners, people feeding their children, putting their... I think there were maybe even a couple making love. And it was just... I thought, how extraordinary that the world is full of places like this, with people in them living. It is an extraordinary thing. Maybe this is why people like me become novelists, to try to solve this extraordinary mystery of there being other people in the world, needing lives that are just as ordinary and banal and boring as mine, and sometimes as transcendently ecstatic as mine. But they're the same as mine, but yet they're infinitely, utterly different. Uh, this is a you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now old, but I still look at the world with a child's eye. It still mystifies me. I do not understand other people. I don't understand the phenomenon. My wife said a wonderful thing to me one day. We were at a cocktail party. And she said, has it ever struck you? that we are four-footed animals standing upright and we're all wearing belts. <laughs> I'd never thought of it before. She said the animals must look at us and say, look, they're standing up and they have these things around their middles. Human beings are, we are an extraordinary, extraordinary phenomenon. Um, dogs, uh, Nietzsche has one, sorry, I'm going on. I'm getting enthusiastic now. Nietzsche has a wonderful thing where he says, the animals look at us as the laughing animal, the weeping animal, as the mad animal. And they do. I see my dog, he looks at me and he thinks, why is he doing this? Why is he behaving in this strange way? And recently, I, my wife and I were having dinner and I, I was upset about something. I was very upset. And I suddenly realized that my dog had come over and was just leaning against me. Because he'd felt my, my anxiety and my pain. Um, and what he was saying to me was, how terrible it is, how tragic it is to be human. You know, why can't you be like us, just live for the day, live for the moment, not fear death. Um, the great gift that we have is the gift of consciousness. And that brings with it the consciousness that we will end. I remember saying, I'll stop at this. I promise I'll stop at this. I was talking to some people one day and I quoted Hemingway saying, how can we live knowing that we shall die? And one of the people in the group that I was talking, a woman of course said, how can we not live knowing that we shall die? Okay? <laughs> Thank you.
Los invito a seguir la conversación a través de los libros. Oh, I encourage you to follow the conversation through the books. He's going to sign his copies now. So thank you very much.